Such topic is the developed memories on Park Chung-hee and Chiang Kai-shek, and their causes and legacies on post-authoritarian societies today. So I would like to first begin my presentation uh, with uh, the uh, two annual word of both South Korea and Taiwan in the year of 2019. For South Korea, the word is interconnected life's bird. For Taiwan, the word is chaotic. I think these two words are best optimizes the, society, the two uh, socially divided societies. I would like to attribute this division to the divided memories of the two paramount authoritarian leaders, which namely uh, Park Chung-hee of South Korea and Chiang Kai-shek of Taiwan. <laughs> so my thesis is divided memories of the two leaders reveal deep ideological and social divisions and have been taken advantage of by partisan politics. Within this context, I encourage further collaborative effort. And my presentation will be divided into two parts. The first part is the causes of the United memory, and the second part is the legal I will mainly focus on the second part, as I think it's the most interesting. <laughs> Uh, in terms of positive memory of Park Chung Hee, it is exemplified by the Park Chung Hee syndrome in the 2000s, in the late 1990s. Several, several causes uh, include nationalist credentials and the narrative portraying him as a hardworking and serious Negative memory of him comes from the impression of him as a dictator who denied society's access to liberal democracy and also his suppression of domestic political opposition. <laughs> his embodiment of the Japanese colonialism also has been a cause of the negative, uh, negative memories of him. In terms of uh, Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan, uh, the reason why he loses a part of the positive memory, I argue, is because he is not believed to be the one who plays the central role in the transformation of Taiwan. Uh, uh, because Taiwan was already on its way to modernization and prosperity when it was a part of the Japanese Imperial Empire. <laughs> Many people uh, in Taiwan uh, most uh, uh, consider Chen Cheng and Chang Ching Kuo or Chiang uh, uh, loyal subordinates to be most credit of Taiwan's economic recovery and industrialization. His collective memory um, uh, comes from socialization and comment of personality, as exemplified by the state's narrative in textbooks, including government tax and uh, corresponding co programs. <laughs> His negative memory of Chiang is very really similar to Park Chung Hee, uh, as the impression of him as a dictator who had been uh, set obsessed with power and the suppression of domestic political opposition. <laughs> he also embodies the link between the mainland China and Taiwan, as he was born uh, in mainland China and considered himself as a legitimate ruler of China. So all people in Taiwan could uh, identify him as a foreign comer imposing a foreign government in South Korea. <laughs> so the second part of the presentation is the legal sense of the divided memories. I think only heroes uh, and presidents are key elements of national identity whose stories provide direction, meaning cohesion to the national community. Whether uh, people in the community champion Park and Chang as national heroes or not conveys a crucial message about the shared values and purposes. Controversy over memory and perceptions about these two leaders, formal leaders, demonstrate the negotiation process of national identity in the two societies. Divided memory divided means that individuals may have different interpretations of the past and different visions of a future desired society. This discrepancy of memory would possibly uh, generate uh, possible uh, social divisions, which may prohibit a vibrant civil societies. Um, these different memories and narratives about former presidents have often been contested. Notably, politicians continue to play an important role in this process by building a certain memory of our, our Chang for their own political interest. So in both, can, in both uh, uh, South Korea and Taiwan, uh, there is one party uh, emphasizing as, uh, the leader as a national hero or organizer, and another party uh, demonizing him as a dictator. <laughs> so why don't we first look at South Korea? Um, the official memorial site, the Seoul National Cemetery in South Korea, uh, it is of high status and it shed light on the official representation of Park Chung-hee. 
And the National Cemetery has both commemorational and educational functions, and it particularly targets to young individuals. And the site constructs a clear-cut heroic portrayal of Park, and uh, there's no mention of his, invo his involvement in the Japanese army, nor the background of his assassination. Um, also, his uh, coffin uh, is preserved in a glass case outdoors in a position at the far end of the cemetery, overlooking the entire site from its elevated position, and even higher than the latest internal grave of President Kim Dae Jung. <laughs> Uh, the, the second point is uh, reinforcing positive memory of Park serves the conservative politician's political purposes. When Park Kune was yet a presidential candidate, she politically exploits people's celebratory memory of her power father, Park Chung-hee, for her campaign. She oversaw the unveiling of a statue in honor of Park, and by inciting this kind of uh, nostalgia for her father among the masses, she aimed to draw a parallel between her and her father to really support. <laughs> In 2016, a national history textbook under Park Kunis administration was produced with an unequivocally conservative leaning. The textbook uh, celebrated the Park style modernization and de-emphasized his political repression. Um, I, I would like to argue that history education reproduce, reproduces memory and shapes uh, the young generation's perception of the past and even their future political orientation. By legitimizing and honoring Park and his policies, the conservative force aims to cultivate incoming conservative leanings uh, uh, electorate or the group who favors conservative party that probably votes for them. <laughs> in response to that, the progressive party, uh, the progressive uh, forces in South Korea, uh, sustains to resist, to resist this trend by forming the national solidarity against the Park Chung Hee Memorial Hall and publishing a white paper articulating his uh, oppressive policies. In addition, they reject the 2016 national textbook under the President Moon Jae-in administration. And uh, from this, we can see the memories have been dragged to two sides, which results in further ideological division in the society. Taiwan is really similar. Competing narratives about the former uh, authoritarian leader, which is uh, Chiang Kai-shek, exist and have been amplified by the politicians. There are two parties, KMT, which is the Nationalist Party, and the DPP, which is the Democratic Progressive Party. So, interestingly, the renaming Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Site is uh, one of the best examples to, 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 to explain this. Chiang's KMT Party built an enormous national site located in the middle of Taipei, which contains the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall, which was at first called Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Square to commemorate Chiang. In early 2000s, when the Democratic Progressive Party DPP President Chen Shui-bian was in power, um, the plaza was renamed to Liberty Party, uh, uh, Liberty Square, sorry, to promote the transitional justice policies, and the Memorial Hall was renamed and shuttered. When KMT candidate uh, Ma, Ma took office in 2008, the how and its name was reverted. Behind the frequent change of the name of the memorial landscape, we can see the different political motivations and the divided narratives. <laughs> so on the left hand side is the Liberty Square, and on the right hand side is the Chiang Kai shek Memorial Square. <laughs> uh, also, pro independence party DPP is trying to erase Chiang's influence through an enacted Transitional Justice Act. For instance, the once ubiquitous statues and images of Chang have recently been removed from public spaces. Why is that? I think it has galvanized many uh, grassroots acts against Chang. Many of his statues have been defaces, beheaded over the island. In 2015, for example, his statue was poured with red and white paint here and ghost money. Spray-painted words such as killer was discovered as well. <laughs> uh, according to a public poll in 2017, over half of the respondents said yes to the question if the DPP government's transi transitional justice policies were manufacturing social conflicts and opposition. This 51.6% uh, means that society is divided in memory of Chang and in measures dealing with this authoritarian leader in a post-authoritarian society. <laughs> 
I think this is has a, a, a more important legacy in the re street uh, relation. Uh, as Chang's legacy concerns the relation with the mainland China, Chang embodies unification and by demonizing and irritating himself in the socio-political sphere, DPP tries to eliminate the link between Taiwan and the mainland. Vandalism of Chiang and constructing negative narrative uh, about him would bring those post chiang generations, those young generations, to DPP's camp. Meanwhile, by portraying him the ter a tyrannical image of an uh, authoritarian government under himself, DPP aims to intimidate Taiwanese of the CCP party, uh, which is uh, at the other side of the street. This trend serves um, the DPP's political interests in the long run. So this is a comparison table uh, between uh, uh, Park Chung hee and Chiang Kai-shek. When I finished my draft, one of the professors uh, suggests me to do a further comparison between Chiang Kai-shek and Sima Rui, and that I think it is also really important and vital for my research. So I'll continue working on this uh, throughout the summer. So mem memories of Park Chung hee and Chiang Kai-shek have been long divided in the two societies. The commemoration also has been contentious, as politicians and also ordinary citizens have all been involved in debate. Um, I would suggest policymakers to collaborate in pushing the projects of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for a more resilient society, which I know is really difficult to accomplish. Um, also, I would like to uh, say that probably people can adopt a more history from a below perspective to revisit the history and to comprehensively re-examine the historical figures. Thank you for listening, and I welcome all of your uh, feedbacks and suggestions on my research. Thank you very much, and I, w I wish you safe and healthy. <laughs>
naturally. However, in the modern world, we have seen the virtual eradication of famines. In fact, North Korea is the only fully literate and industrialized nation in world history to ever experience a famine. And for that reason, we can assume that this famine, unlike what the regime states as occurring from poor climate conditions, but rather occurring because of policy failure. This was also coupled with the collapse of the public distribution system, which was a system instituted by the North Korean regime to control the collection and redistribution of food supply in North Korea. This system is still ineffective to this day. North Korea's economic decline and the rise of markets was also brought about by the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. When North Korea lost its largest tra trading partner and key ally, this really caused North Koreans to start thinking on their feet and in turn, markets started to rise. While this marketization did occur, this was not openly welcomed by the regime whatsoever. And this is due greatly um, by the fact that the regime is based on this ideology known as juche or self-reliance. The idea of markets that they are inherently autonomous poses a direct threat to the regime. And in turn, the regime would often, and still to this day at times, intervenes militarily to suppress these markets. Through my research, I also looked at the interconnectedness between three key sectors in developing economies. These sectors include the food, energy, and transportation sectors. Now, when we look specifically at the transportation sector in Korea, we can see its faults. And when one sector fails, the, other do, the others do as well. And in order to have a robust, healthy developing economy, you must have all three factors working harmoniously. While the whole world was exper experiencing a boom in the automobile industries, North Korea had about one vehicle, which includes cars, buses, and trains for every 250 people in North Korea. And this shockingly low figure proves the backwardness of North, Korean, North Korea's transportation sector. And this wasn't purely due to the fact that North Korea's industry was uh, lagging behind, but rather due to the fact that the state wanted to control its citizens' mobility. And this had some unexpected consequences in that the food and energy sectors were hit extremely hard. This also hindered North Korea's marketization. Despite these challenges facing North Korea's markets, they did survive and spread nonetheless. And this influence from the markets led to an influx of foreign goods, including, including foreign media. And this influx of foreign media led to the birth of a new generation known as the Jangmadang generation, or the generation that grew up around these markets. When we look at this survey conducted by Beyond Parallel, we see that 33 out of 36 of the North Koreans that responded said they used foreign media at least once per month, which shows how widespread this foreign media has become. Now, this foreign media may include South Korean dramas, Hollywood movies, etc. And once North Koreans get their hands on this contraband, they start to look and see what the outside world is actually like or what they may perceive it to be from these films and this media despite what the regime has been telling them their whole lives. And this, of course, poses a direct threat to the legitimacy of the regime. Under the Kim Jong-il era, we saw the promulgation of the military first policy or the Songun policy. However, we have seen a slight shift under Kim Jong-un as he has pursued the Byongjin policy. The Byongjin policy aims to pursue the simultaneously parallel development between North Korea's economic development and its military development. When Kim Jong-il died in 2011, Kim Jong-un gave a speech to his citizens that he would promise to uh, supply the people of Pyongyang plenty of fish and hot water. And I saw this as a symbolic gesture that Kim Jong-un would base his legacy and his regime's legitimacy not solely on North Korea's military might, but also based on North Korea's economic development. However, these claims have not been fully realized and the, the North Korean regime often gives excuses to why this is not the case, blaming outsiders, blaming the UN sanctions placed on North Korea, rather than being introspective and reflecting on one's policy failures. 
Lastly, I do want to bring up the point that China does act as an enabler in this situation. When we observe this chart that displays North Korea's trading partners, we see a little bit of Russia, a little bit of Peru, and some smaller countries on the right. However, it is clear that North Korea participates in a large amount of its trade with China. In fact, 94% of North Korea's trade is conducted with the PRC. And although on paper, China is compliant with the UN sanctions imposed on North Korea, in practice, China often evades these sanctions in order to participate in trade with North Korea. And this does have some direct positive benefits on North Korea's economy. However, it also produces a relationship similarly to that of North Korea and the Soviet Union before the Soviet Union's collapse in that North Korea is perhaps a little over-reliant on China. And we see, really saw this uh, result in certain instances due to the volatility that the Chinese market and having China as one sole trading partner brings about. In 2003, with the SARS epidemic and outbreak in China, we saw that North Korean supply chains and industries were hit dramatically. And I can't imagine how North Korea is dealing with the current outbreak of COVID-19 today. And this brings me further to my point that the marketiza marketization of North Korea has been necessary for its survival, but it simultaneously poses a direct threat to the North Korean regime. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Summer. Uh, people can come back to their videos. So since um, Yu Chen is not here, I suggest that we use the rest of the time to ask him questions to Summer for about five minutes. I have a question. Okay. Um, so my question is kind of about the last part of your presentation where you mentioned the PRC as an enabler. Um, would you agree that China is fearful of the collapse of the regime, which, you know, famine and um, other issues pose towards it. Do you think that by China providing these routes to market or goods, um, it's kind of trying to prevent any um, collapse of the regime and fear of getting refugees from North Korea? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, China's position in regards to North Korea has a lot to do with maintaining the status quo. And if we see a, they don't want to see a collapse of the North Korean regime because that would result in perhaps an influx of refugees into China, as well as, um, you know, bringing out a new administration if some, the next administration in North Korea would be, um, you know, allied with the U.S. or perhaps if North Korea were to reunify, that would pose a direct threat to China because the U.S. would be knocking at China's back door at the border at that point. Uh, I'm Yano Kim uh, at GW. Uh, since this uh, topic is really uh, something I have been uh, working on uh, for many years, so uh, I think uh, I have to make a couple of comments on this. Uh, first, when it comes to marketization in the North Korea, I think uh, we need to be careful on uh, defining uh, what marketization there it is. Uh, obviously, um, you know, if you just uh, uh, put a, a, a criteria of our society, then uh, it's way below our expectation. But uh, if you are talking about transition, then you can uh, see a, a huge amount of uh, changes there. Uh, even though the speed of change is, is not that uh, fast enough, from North Korea's point of view, it might be really fast. That's something I want to point out first. And then, uh, you know, if you compare Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un's uh, policy on marketization, Kim Jong-il just went back and forth from tolerance to uh, cracking down on the market, uh, market activities. But Kim Jong-un, he has been uh, somewhat consistent uh, in terms of uh, being uh, tolerant on what's going on in uh, North Korea. And, uh, even uh, the, the government um, or regime, they even provided cell phone uh, service, uh, 3G cell phone service. 
there's still 3G, but uh, the, the uh, subscribers uh, number is really uh, uh, growing uh, exponentially. And the, uh, people like uh, youngsters, if you don't have cell phone, then you cannot, there's no chance you can uh, make a girlfriend. That's a running joke there. And uh, Changmadan people, if you don't have a cell phone, then there's no way you can survive there. And Servicha, a private uh, transportation system, is growing. Uh, partly and uh, I think significantly because uh, the, the, the state itself is just trying to uh, ignore, you know, accept it. Or a lot of uh, corrupt uh, officials are involved here. So a lot of things are going on here. So um, I think, um, again, marketization in North Korea, it seems really uh, simple, but when you, when you uh, come closer and try to, uh, you know, uh, look what's really going on on the ground, then it's, it's, the picture is really complicated. Thank you. Actually, if I could uh, jump in. Um, so my, I guess my question would be, do you think that uh, grassroots level um, uh, marketization can enable change? So for example, uh, just to jump on what Yona was saying, um, so there's like an Uber style um, taxi service in North Korea um, that is absolutely fascinating and uh, individuals are taking it to themselves to uh, gain more capital based on this. Uh, in other words, there are more cars, um, there are private cars, and it's all private service. There is a nationalized uh, taxi service, but on top of that, in addition to that, there is uh, this kind of Uber style, uh, pseudo Uber style uh, taxi service. Uh, YouTube has uh, tons of uh, uh, North Korean films these days. In fact, uh, it's actually uh, uh, promoted by the state. And this kind of soft power to uh, you know, gain more recognition and uh, you know, stretching its tentacles to, to the uh, remote places in the world, um, you know, it seems to be some kind of uh, change and move that North Korea is really desiring. And um, uh, one last thing is uh, I, just got, I just got an email from Pyongyang two days ago um, regarding uh, a book publication. And uh, I think at this point, uh, North Korea is really trying to translate more of their uh, uh, novels or whatnot uh, into English and various other languages to really promote this kind of soft power uh, and, and just really reach out there, right? It's a different kind of marketization. Um, but yeah, my question is, you know, these are all kind of like uh, small, minor, uh, I think the uh, economy that you were talking about is like the grand ones, right? The real big ones right that really moves one country to another um but maybe it doesn't have to be like that right maybe it can be small pockets of marketization that really enable change um and i don't know in, in the next 10 15 years we'll see a different kind of north korea just a question yeah so that's obviously a very broad question and i definitely think these markets are bringing about positive change to north korea and the reason why i got interested in this topic was because I saw the markets as a, a possible piece of hope in this idea of the big question that is North Korea. And we don't really see much progress being made in terms of diplomacy and in regards to North Korea's nuclear development. And when I saw, when I first heard about North Korea's uh, marketization, I thought this could be a good way for North Koreans to expose themselves to the outside world. And I think information is truly powerful. So. Once that were to happen, I did start uh, idealistically thinking that maybe this could lead to a possible uh, overturn of the regime or something crazy like that. I don't see that happening anytime soon, but it could be a possibility. But in the short term, I do think the markets, especially the ones that are uh, developing along the border with China, I think it is really transforming North Koreans' daily lives, improving their livelihoods. And I think that's a positive thing. We see that people on the border with China, they're maybe even possibly doing better off now than the people of Pyongyang, as well as, uh, yeah, just this influx of foreign media. I think that's really what the, my big emphasis was in this project, as well as um, I also want to, you know, bring up the point that even if this marketization does lead to positive outcomes, 
in the end, I think it's important to remember that this marketization was reluctant and the regime has not always been compliant in it. And it has ultimately resulted due to necessity. And it's something that has resulted organically rather than the regime being supported above it this whole time. Okay, thank you, Summer. Um, I think that, again, the kind of comments and suggestions and questions will help you all to uh, revise and better your papers. The third section, uh, we have Caitlin Ranieri.